Hello everyone. Good afternoon. Um, in this talk, uh, we'll take a comparative dive between gRPC and another protocol called TTRPC. We'll uh, look into the protocol itself, understand the key differences, and also see how they fare with respect to each other. I'm Archana, and this is my co-speaker, Sadipto Pandit. We work at Microsoft with a team called Azure Linux. And uh, let's get started. Uh, so first of all, I think we must know, because it's a newer protocol, what is TTRPC. And uh, first of all, why are we talking about in gRPC confits, not even gRPC? <laughs> uh, well, uh, I think gRPC was created almost 10 years ago, uh, although the 1.0 version might release a little bit later, almost eight years after that. It's been quite, uh, uh, in cloud native space, we've seen its implementation quite ubiquitously. And uh, mostly in microservice distributor system and microservices between uh, microservices, interprocess, uh, the inter-service communication, we can see it's most wide uses. Uh, but uh, one of the things uh, gRPC chose when it's, when it's uh, creating, when they designed it, it's that uh, they chose it to build it on top of HTTP2, which is great. It has uh, many features and it's like a newer protocol. Uh, but it comes with overhead, uh, overhead of protocol being uh, with so many features and also it comes with over uh, whenever you want to use the uh, gRPC you want to you are indirectly using HTTP2 thus like whenever you are implementing in a runtime or any system you are uh, loading the libraries of HTTP2 as well which uh, so the the newer TTRPC protocol is uh, intended for a low memory and low latency environments it was designed with that specification that uh, wherever uh, the requirement is for lower memory footprint and lower latency. Uh, and while uh, for most of our uh, gRPC use cases, you see that uh, it might not be the requirement to have a really low memory footprint or really low latency footprint. But let's say when you are using it in a environment where there, in a single host, there are multiple services, they are talking to each other. and uh, or in a very memory tight constrained environment. In that case, it could become a problem for uh, using gRPC because it comes with overhead. And of course, it has features. Uh, and also, this TTRPC is designed to mostly in an inter-service communication. It's like service to, you know, you're in a backend environment where uh, in a distributed system, mostly in the same host, or you can say it's a same network behind the firewall and you are communicating between them. In that case, uh, it is designed for. And uh, or because it's uh, designed in that way, we, we can we can see that we can remove the HTTP 2 some of this layer because we don't need uh, generally in a similar na same network environment or the same host. You con connections are pretty stable because the network is not traveling over the globe. So. And uh, TTRPC currently has a support for Golang and Rust currently. Of course, it is not as widespread wide, wide as gRPC. gRPC has support for like almost most of the popular languages we know. And I think uh, uh, official support for most of the popular languages, even unofficially, maybe much more. Uh, but of course, uh, when this protocol was designed to cut down some of the features uh, uh, for tier gRPC to make some of the trade-offs to for better memory and latency uh, implementations. It assumes that it has to be in a reliable connection environment. That means you cannot uh, deploy it in a across the globe where connection could be broken very easily. It also removes the uh, HTTP2 so it does not have your uh, standard features of uh, a HTTP2 protocol like handset, reset, pings, or it actually removes flow control. Uh, also, TLS is uh, removed for because we are will be running in the same host environment, so uh, it is assumed when designing this pro, uh, designing this protocol that we will be running behind a firewall, so we might not need security features of TLS. 
so let's see who uses DTRPC. We just uh, want, wanted to know who used it. So we went to GitHub up repos of this too. We found out, okay, most of uh, many companies directly, indirectly. Above, uh, we listed companies who are directly using it. Uh, and indirectly, many more who are using mostly container D. Uh, container is very popular, so there are a lot of projects who are built on top of container D, uh, and those are using it. Now, okay, so let's uh, understand the differences in the protocol stack and how it differs to uh, HTTP, like HTTP two, can like because HTTP, gRPC is built on HTTP two, will define uh, how. The, this protocol has um, cut down to a slimmer version. Uh, so we mapped the gRPC protocol in top of HTTP 2's um, TCP IP stack. Uh, as we learned, the TTRPC did some of the trimming of this protocol to make it slimmer, make it more simpler. So it can be used in a, it can gain some benefits o over uh, the gRPC. So let's. First of all, we see the network and transport layer. It is, uh, it is quite same. Of course, we didn't. Uh, it will be very hard to remove these two layers. I think the last time we saw the Quick try to, you know, replace the TCP part, like the transport part of it. But it had to do it on UDP because uh, these two layers are kind of standard. Or like replacing this means uh, replacing all the hardwares uh, who are uh, going. Uh, so. Well, that was kept same because it won't be you know, very hard to do that. And as we discussed that we won't, we'll be running mostly, this use case is mostly behind a firewall use case, so TLS can be removed. And uh, most of his uh, HTTP, uh, so now we're left with the application protocol, application layer, and uh, most of the HTTP 2's features and all these uh, features of channels, frames, comes with uh, comes in the it's binary framing layer where you have uh, like headers are frames also data payloads are frame uh, as we discover we are trimming down it making it more simpler so that uh, part of it it replaced with the message framing it uh, but we kept the protobuf as well because uh, protobuf is is uh, in DTRPC is used for generally only for serialization deserialization part of it. Uh, in the specification of this protocol, it does not define specifically how the routing logic for RPC is. So RPC part of it is still the same. I uh, mean that in gRPC also RPC uh, routing of the RPC, which method or uh, which service to invoke, it is done. Uh, it is the similar in TTRPC. You, uh, it does not define in the specification. It just tells the implementation has to do it in a way that it is. Uh, it is possible to route based on the service name and the method name. So it is up to the implementation. The standard implementation the TTRPC uh, did was in the Golang. Then um, uh, later on, people from Alibaba, they started using it for Rust as well. So they, now it is uh, officially incorporated in the container DA uh, projects as well. So now let's understand the how it now we've seen that, okay, we replaced the binary protocol with uh, much simpler uh, much simpler message framing protocol. And this uh, this is the message frame it will look like. And uh, as you can see, that it's like a 10 byte header uh, on the message frame. So first a four byte data length, stream ID, and your message type and flags. Uh, these I will come back to it, what is the, uh, when we explain how the protocol communicates. So. Uh, let's understand how this. Uh, uh, let's understand how this protocol works over a streaming uh, streaming request and response. As you can see, uh, this is for a TTRPC stream, where uh, client and server both are doing streaming request and response. So, in the client, client will first in a, in this streaming scenario, uh, client will first send a request payload, and that will come up with a remote open flag. These remote open, uh, remote open, remote close, these flags are, if you see, go back, we can see that these flags are in the, like, message, uh, there are two things, message types and flags. So remote, remote open means that 
whenever server receives a payload with the remote open flag, that means this uh, for server, the remote is the client and client is open for sending more data. So you can easy, simply think of the remote open as means the, uh, the server is expecting more data. It's open for more data. So you get another payload. It's a, if it's empty, empty flag, it will be remote open. Now, now once we receive the last data payload with the remote close flag, the server knows that okay, it's done with the remote close. And uh, implicitly, it also means local close. Local close means locally, the client will not produce more any data. That local close part is uh, kept on the global implementation just to maintain the state of the client and server. Uh, the, once the server receives the remote close, it, it knows that okay, client is done sending all the streaming data. Now we start sending the response data. Uh, it's like I am here showing a bidirectional stream, so it will start sending a response. Uh, whenever it sends with the remote close flag, it will now the server when it sends the remote close flag, that means server is done with the data response, and both of the client and server will become in a finished state. So this finished implicitly means also remote closed because that means that other uh, peer is not going to send any more data. Uh, this is a like a, it's a client stream, but uh, server just a single response. Similarly, but uh, the response payload, if you the message type is response, it implicitly means it's also the last payload remote closed state. So it becomes in a finished state very quickly. And if we go to Unity stream, it's very simple. In Unity, you don't send any flags. That automatically server assumes it's a single request it, um, as you can see the protocol is pretty simple and uh, we just like this is the specification uh, we talked about but we wanted to see how the how it actually behaves over the wire so we capture the packets and uh, so this is for a ttrpc single unary call so you can see that okay it's for a single unary call uh, it's like just sends a 10 packets uh, and uh, Although most of the TCP handshakes also, uh, it's like it's, it takes a single turn and sends a one data packet to the from the client and one from the server back. Total is around 80 bytes communication. And if you compare that with the gRPC, it's uh, of course it's uh, more. But uh, as we said, uh, it comes with a lot of features. It has you know HTTP2 comes with uh, window window upgrades and those all other frames and there are control frames also. Uh, but as you can see, it takes seven turns to uh, c complete a single request for the first time. And uh, the bytes which are transferred is also higher. It's like 380 bytes. Uh, so uh, yes, I think we uh, understood what the protocol does and how it behaves on the network. Now I'll give this back to my colleague to explain how we do the benchmarks and what are the results. Hello again. Um, so why did we benchmark TTRPC and gRPC? We encountered this protocol when we were working with a project called Kata Containers, um, in which the container D shim, the Kata shim, talks to Kata agent, which is a runtime agent, via this protocol, TTRPC. So uh, we kind of searched, and uh, we, we found that container D also supports gRPC, but gRPC is not being used in client uh, part of the agent. So we wanted to see how the two protocols behave in inter-service communication, such as between shim and agent. And uh, we, uh, we tried to look for matrix, but, but we didn't find any. So with that motivation, we wanted to explore. Uh, we wanted to see performance, and we wanted to see, uh, in the context of memory and latency, how does the two protocol behave. So now, in any inter-service communication, minimizing latency is crucial. Um, for our benchmark benchmarking methodology, we used very simple protobuf files uh, from the official repos of uh, gRPC and TTRPC. So very hello, uh, simple hello request, hello reply, you know, protobufs. We generated the uh, required binaries and uh, definitions and all. And uh, once we were done, so uh, we created a tool which allows you to uh, specify the concurrency and it uh, allows you to specify the time for which you want to do the measurement. Um, uh, and it will output the data in terms of, for example, average, median, and P99, P90, and output this to a file as well. So uh, for our measurement, we set up the servers, very simple ones with the protobufs. 
and uh, we measured the latency we initially did so initially we warmed up the cache with 200 preliminary requests and uh, subsequently we bombarded the system with 5k requests so initially you would see that there is a spike um, uh, so x-axis represents the request number and y-axis represents the latency in microseconds initially you'll see that spike so despite warming up the cache you see that uh, there is a spike but uh, as the system settles down there is a stabilization um, and uh, you can see the plots for tdrpc and grpc TDRPC on average gave uh, 100 microseconds of latency and uh, GRPC gave 150 microseconds of latency. We wanted to see how the trend continues as we give more uh, requests. So for 30k requests, the trend was kind of similar. So uh, <coughs> uh, we, we noticed that there is a difference of 50 microseconds on average between the two protocols. Uh, but considering that over the wire uh, TTRPC is slimmer, it has uh, lesser uh, round trips per request, uh, we see how that theoretical advantage um, actually shows up in real world performance. So, yeah. For, uh, so the next one was memory profiling. For memory profiling, we wanted to use definitions from ContainerD shim so that we are able to simulate a real world example and see how the two protocols behave in you know a realistic context and uh, so we picked up create task request which is one of the uh, uh, most used uh, uh, service of uh, ContainerD. Um, so we we generated the proto files there and using the server in interceptor we basically measured so we used golang's uh, implementation of grpc and tdrpc and uh, we used golang read memstats to get the statistics from go runtime which basically has memory allocation and also garbage collection values there and uh, we used two values, one was sys and the other is heap released. Sys represents the memory which is claimed by Go Runtime for the application and heap, heap released is the memory which is released back to the operating system by the garbage collector. So the effective memory usage comes down to sys minus heap released. This, uh, this, this metric essentially represents the virtual memory address space which is allocated to this Go application. Next, we plotted the data for the two protocols. And uh, we did this for three different kind of payload sizes, starting from 64 KIB till 4 MIB. Uh, on the x-axis, again, there is a request number. And uh, on y-axis, you will see Go app memory. That's in uh, MIB. So um, the lines represent the payload sizes. Sorry, the line represents the trends. And uh, for uh, you can see that for lower payload sizes, GRPC performs better than TDRPC. And um, uh, so this suggests that the core runtime management of memory allocation and garbage collection for GRPC is better for TDRPC. We also wanted to see how this you know, translates in physical memory usage for the two kind of protocols. So we used PSS and RSS values from uh, PMAP tool. And uh, uh, again, for three different payload sizes. And this is the data that we got. Uh, so the red line is TTRPC and uh, blue line is GRPC. So physical memory usage wise, let me show you the next graphs as well actually. Yeah, and uh, you'll see that initially there is like a stable line, which is basically we kept the system idle for uh, 10 seconds and then we started snapshotting the system every uh, one second. Uh, to get the physical memory usage for each of the payload sizes and 5k requests. So you can see that um, physical memory usage wise TDRPC performs better than GRPC. So which suggests that there is efficient physical memory usage and maybe sharing of the library is more efficient. And but we can also notice that as the payload size increase, there is almost no difference between the two protocols. So we also wanted to see how that fares out in Rust. Uh, we used PSS and RSS values for the Rust implementation. We used uh, Tonic for uh, gRPC, and uh, we used uh, TDRPC Rust implementation. And uh, this is the plot for the, those two. And in this, we can notice that TDRPC does not perform as well. Um, gRPC is actually memory efficient than TDRPC for Rust implementation. 
So that was all the data that we got from our benchmarks. Uh, what are the takeaways? TDRPC is lighter over the network. It is slimmer protocol. And it has slightly better latency as compared to gRPC. But it is not as memory efficient as one might expect it to be. And uh, so TDRPC in its concept is very good. But looking at the results, we think that implementation could be improved. Um, that was all. From our side, I have attached some references. I have attached the tools um, that we used for our benchmarking and profiling. That is it. Thank you. Any questions? So when you say um, this is for inter-service communication on the same host, so um, like I believe most of the use cases are service mesh in which you know a yeah, production based yeah. system yeah. in which we have thousands of services communicating with each other. Mm -hmm. So what's the use case like apart from your use case in which you know you want to talk about inter -con container uh, communications? Like what other use case do you feel this would fit as like TTRP? TTRPC can be um, chosen over GRPC, like because for our use case, like, uh, like oh. most of the services are inter microservice communication. Okay. So, um, as you uh, as you said, uh, like service mesh is kind of a one use case that uh, could, uh, that could be done. I think uh, out of this cloud, uh, could use for uh, like a IoT kind of MQTT replacement. I think. Um, so that can be done, but of course, then we have to look at uh, an external security proxy out of it, even if the IoT use case or other use case, where wherever you're exposing this TTRPC to the internet, it has to come up with uh, another proxy layer of security or something that, if it's an inter service communication, anywhere uh, the requirement is, uh, so basically the requirement has to be, it doesn't, if it's already behind a firewall, and it would require very low latency implementations, then it could be, uh, then anywhere that it could be used. Okay. And one more question, like uh, there was a mention about, in, this, in your slide about um, like binary frame versus the message frame. Hmm. And you're, when you're using protobuf, then how do you, like when protobuf serialize, right? It's huh. already converting it to some binary frames. Like, uh, uh, yes, I mean the naming of the uh, stuff is like it still uses binary. Uh, so the naming of it's like message framing, which like it was done as a for HTTP two. It's called binary framing, and uh, and after like it, it was named in the TTIP as a message framing, and how the messages are framed, it still uses protobuf, and it's true that data payload part of it still will be a binary version of the payload. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, once you use protobuf, it will convert into a binary representation and then like send it over the network. So yes, uh, there is binary data part of it is still binary. Other parts are not uh, converted to a binary. Okay. Um, got a question. Um, has this been played with uh, non-TCP based protocol, probably uh, or maybe reliable UDP? Uh, no, uh, I no, it was not done. Uh, it's like for I think uh, even for gRPC, they are experimenting with quick. Uh, uh, right. So but maybe one. Right? Yes, I know. It's, it's not. Ex it's still experimental. I mean, it's saw in the repo and there are talks going on. So I think. Okay. Any anything else? Uh, okay. Thank you.